This recipe is for traditional osobuco, the way that it would be made in a restaurant, the way that I've prepared it in restaurants that I've been the executive chef at. This is not a fast, easy recipe. You cannot make good osobuco in a pressure cooker or in a slow cooker. It has to be done with love. And here's how to do it. Okay, the first step is to salt your meat with heavy coarse salt. You salt it quite a lot. Much more than you think you're going to need because this is the only salt the dish is going to get and it's going to be cooking for a lot of meat here. So this is some pretty thick pieces of meat. Now we're going to add flour. We're not adding any black pepper because of the amount of browning time this meat is going to have, the black pepper would actually burn and that wouldn't be good. So we're also using much more flour than we would use with chicken. Again because of the amount of braising time here and it will absorb it. It will be fine. It's not like uh, if you put this much flour on chicken you're going to get gummy chicken at the end. You can get away with that with beef that's braised for a very long time and you just get a thicker sauce at the end. It's ready to brown. Okay, I'm using a high-sided two-quart pan here. <clears throat> has a relatively small surface area on the bottom. There's a reason for this. Also getting the pan very hot before I add enough olive oil to cover the bottom. The oil's smoking almost immediately. That's what we want. Now we're going to brown the pieces one at a time in the pan. As you can see the, the surface of the pan is just a little bit bigger than the uh, the meat itself here. And this is going to brown really well. You want a lot of caramelization on this because this is where your flavor for the dish is coming from. If you don't do this step, it won't be also both going in. You know, uh, as you can see, I'm, I took this meat right to the point of almost burning. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more and it would have burned. In goes the second piece. Again, the same thing with that. And this is one of the, really the only secret to the buco for great flavor, is that you need to bring it right to that edge, right to where it's going to be burned next. You've saved it just before it burns. That's where all the flavor is at. Now, right away to the same hot pan, we're going to add the mirepoix, carrot, celery, onion. We're going to start stirring that around to deglaze the pan. Get all those brown bits up. And also to cook this down quite a lot. To reduce the heat just a little bit, it was on maximum, now it's medium high. This is going to cook until the vegetables are very soft. After three or four minutes, when the vegetables have already softened some, you can add the tomato sauce. Add about half of the garlic. This is how you build layers of flavor. You want the deep rich garlic taste at the bottom, but you also want some higher notes in the meat. So you're going to add the rest of the garlic later on. And we're just going to let this cook for another four or five minutes to get it softer. Okay, it's been a few minutes. I'm going to add an ounce a rich cherry wine to this. This is one of the ingredients that you don't see very often in recipes printed in English. The addition of, of wine and cognac is basic to the classic recipe, but for some reason it's not reported in most of the English language books. So when that's dry again, now I'm going to add an ounce of cognac. 
Now you could flambe this if you wanted to. It really doesn't need to because it's going to be cooked for a while. The alcohol is going to burn off anyway. At least most of it. If there's a little bit of alcohol left in it, it's okay. An ounce distributed through all this meat and vegetables won't be noticeable. So you can flambe it if you like to. Now we're going to add, pretty dry, we're going to add a cup of white wine. Now you might think red wine would be good because the sauce is dark. The problem with red wine in this recipe is that the, the flavors won't be bright in the end. You want to use white wine. Um, I use a Chardonnay, but uh, really ideally you would use an Italian wine. So you're going to bring this up to uh, a boil and then you're going to uh, get it ready to put on the meat for the oven. Okay, I've got an oven proof casserole dish here. I'm going to layer a little bit of the liquid down on the bottom. This will keep the meat from sticking to the pan. Then I'm going to put the pieces of meat back on top. As you can see, they're pretty seriously browned. Now we're going to put the rest of these vegetables over the top. You want to use the vegetables to cover the top of the meat so that as it braises, the braising juices run off the lid of the pan through the vegetables and down into the meat. You have to pile the vegetables up on top or you won't get the full impact of, the, of them being there. Now that we've got those there, we can go back and add the rest of that garlic that we didn't use before. As well as some rosemary. I use quite a lot of rosemary. This is about a teaspoon and a half dried, which is really a lot. If it was fresh rosemary, that would be quite a few sprigs. And that's it. You put the lid on and it's ready for the oven. I'm going to braise it at a pretty low temperature for about three hours. Okay, this is the unveiling point. It's been roasted at 130 degrees Celsius for the last two hours after the first hour where it was roasted at 160. As you can see, meat is just about coming off the bone. Now we're going to remove this to a platter and strain off the sauce. Okay, sauce has been strained. We're going to transfer this liquid into a pan to reduce it, to make it thick. As for what to do with these solids, well, they're a little bit goopy. You could put them on the meat as well. I honestly, I just toss them. The meat's already covered with vegetables that are much better tasting than these. But there's nothing wrong with them. You can eat them if you want to. So the sauce is reducing. And now we're going to make the gremolata. Little minced parsley. Some grated lemon zest. And some crushed garlic. One of the few times I actually use crushed garlic. But in a gremolata, it, it makes perfect sense. And finally, a little olive oil. It just mix this up on the board. Very simple, classic garnish. Just right over the top, just before you're serving it. As soon as the sauce is done reducing, we'll continue. Okay, the sauce is very thick now. This is also quite salty and very strong flavored. So you're not going to use very much of it. This is just going to be a little bit on the plate underneath the meat. And here we have our finished dish. Traditional also buco. Also look for my cocktail book, Cocktails of the South Pacific and Beyond, Advanced Mixology, available through Amazon online.